My, uh, before we jump into, I, I really, <laughs> I know we're circling on this theme, but I'm telling you what, God, God, God's heart is in on this. Um, I believe probably many of your hearts are in on it too. The, the title of the message, message is called One Body. Now we're one body. The, Bi- the Bible talks about how we're unified in Christ. We're one body with all the believers, no matter where they're at. If it's here, if it's in Westfield, if it's in Ukraine, we are connected to them. And I wanted to really give us as the body an opportunity to reach out and support our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. And I've been praying about it a little bit, and I've been listening to, well, I've been praying about it a lot of it, but um, how can we do that? And uh, I think I discovered a way where we can really influence and touch and help and assist these people. And um, I want to share that to you this morning. I know you guys are praying. I know that with all my heart. And um, I know you guys are paying attention too. But I also think there's a time that God calls us to step up to the plate. Not just to allow it to remain in our prayer life and remain just words, but even to... Um, to, to take action, take action, right? Because the Bible says where our treasure is, our heart will be there also, all right? So when we, want, we want to make, uh, to, to establish our heart where it needs to be, establish our heart where it needs to be. I was reading, and I want to share this with you. Ukrainian pra- pastors, um, wrote this to their Christian brothers in Russia this week, on Tuesday, actually. It was uh, written by um, this Ukrainian. He says, remember Mordecai and Esther. Do not be like Jehoshaphat, who entered into allegiance with Ahab and was silent when God spoke through his prophet Micaiah. And what what we're seeing here to understand what's happening is Russia is doing something incredible right now. They're censoring everything. And what they're doing is they're raising the stakes. So in the media, what's happened is the media is reporting exactly what the propaganda of the uh, government wants them to report. All the way to the extent where I've read or, or, or looked at some things where actually mothers back home in Russia that have been indoctrinated by this propaganda uh, are getting phone calls from their sons on the battlefield telling them what really is happening. And because they've been so brainwashed by the government, they actually are believe, not believing their own children. And they're saying, no, th- that's not true. This is what the media is saying. This is what we're being told. This is what's happening on the battlefield. You must not be seeing it right. So it's, it's that powerful of an instrument that they're using right now to cause the Russians to believe only what they're being told through media. So there's this massive censorship that's happening right now. And these Ukrainian pastors are reaching out to their fellow brothers in Russia saying, look, this needs to be exposed. We're dying out here. People are dying left and right for this senselessness of war. And so this Ukrainian pastor reached out through the networks to his, his fellow brothers and sisters in Russia to say, look, you're being lied to. And we need your help. We need you to get this, this message out to the people so that they, would under, they understand what truly is happening in our nation right now. He literally accuses, this is what he does, he makes it out of love. If you read the whole story, and I'm trying to just kind of give you the highlights of it, but he accuses his Russian colleagues, this pastor is accusing his Russian colleagues, saying that you are buying into the national rhetoric right now. He says, you fear prison, but do not be faithful to Putin. Be faithful to the body of Christ. What, what Putin is doing right now is he established some new laws where he says, if anyone says anything in regards to this fake news, he's calling it fake news, that they'll be in jeopardy of spending 15 years in prison. 
That's pretty significant. Think about that. 15 years. Anything he deems to be fake and doesn't line up with his agenda, he's calling fake, and you'll be imprisoned up to 15 years. And, he's, and he literally says, anyone who calls this anything other than a military operation and refers to it as war is in jeopardy of being in prison. So that's what's happening right now in Russia today. This has literally been developing this, this week. As we've been going about our lives, this is what's taking place in the lives of believers in Russia and Ukraine today. He goes on to say, your silence now is the blood and tears of Ukrainian children, mothers, and soldiers that is on your hands. So he's just desperately reaching out to his fellow brothers and sisters in the, in the body. And one pastor, another pastor in Ukraine wrote on his Facebook, many believers in Russia are praying about the situation, in quotes. So he's saying many believers in Russia believe there's a situation in happening in Ukraine, but they don't really understand the full extent of what's taking place right here. He says, this situation is called war. And he says, and when you pray again, and he's, and, he, and he's calling them out, he says, when you pray again, tell God it's war and that we are being killed out here. Or we are being killed out here. Now, now note this. Even though this is taking place, and this is amazing, taking place in the Ukrainian uh, country right now or in the nation of Ukraine, the Ukrainians, and I'm, I'm reading about reports that blow my mind, that they still have love and adoration for their brother Russians. They're literally giving them quarters. They're literally helping them at times. They're literally going out and sharing the gospel with these Russian soldiers. And they're showing them the love of Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that that's always it. Some of them are encountering them in war tactics. But the bottom line is their heart is still for their brother. Their heart's for their brother. They're praying for their brother. They're believing for their brother. And they're not taking this war as tit for tat. They're not retaliating. They're defending themselves. But as soon as the Russians back away they're, and, and, and quit, they're done, which is amazing to me. So since this letter on this, this past Tuesday, it, we've seen extraordinary courage from the Russian, Russian church start to begin. Mert. Mert Publishing House, which is this evangelical publisher in St. Petersburg, literally published this. They put out a petition to gather signatures. Within two days, they had 400 signatures from different pastors around Russia to demand that Putin would be dethroned. Amen. Think about, think about the cost of putting your name on that piece of paper. Think about that. This letter is crossing boundaries in so many ways for the Russian evangelical church to be getting involved in, in government politics there. One of the original nine signers of this 400 signature document says this, the church's first calling is proclamation of the word of God. And this proclamation happens in many different ways. Pastors preach, theologians write, philanthropists give out bread, people weep with those who weep, activists take the squares. It is important for each of us to see our calling and fulfill it honestly before God, serving him and his people. That meant a lot to me. That meant a lot to me. He's literally calling people to, to take their role, to, to fulfill the calling at this time, wherever it might be. And there's many callings. He's not limiting to just pastors or theologians or philanthropists or whatever the case. He says everyone has a role to play. Everybody has a role to play. And fulfill that role honestly before God. Serving, not only serving the people, but also serving God in this role. Powerful. 
Over 300 evangelical Russian pastors wrote an open letter addressing their company says, or their country, and it says, "The time has come when each of us must call things by their real names, whether we still have why we still have time to escape the punishment from above and prevent the collapse of our country." We call on the authorities of our country to stop the senseless bloodshed. And they quoted Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8, saying, A nation that turns from its evil will be spared. They also referred to this as, um, as their country as the Cain attacking their brother Abel. And they actually referred to Putin as a Cain. You literally see in a modern day Cain and Abel unfolding before our eyes. Before our eyes. In Matthew 26, they says, put, away, put your swords back in their place. This is the, the words of Jesus. For those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So this, this Ukrainian pastor recently, within just the last few days, received these statements with great joy and fervent prayer. They literally, he writes this, he says, they literally are risking their life because they show the love, their love to the Lord and to his body. We are one in spirit. We are one in spirit. Now the question is, where does it leave us today? Where does it leave us as the church? Because we can't afford to turn a blind eye to this. I really, don't, I, I really believe God is calling our church to be responsible where we are at today. Be able to answer the call. James 2.15 says this. It says, if a brother or sister, now it's literally referring here in James, it's re literally referring to the body of Christ. So he's saying, if a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. Now, do you see that word body reoccurring? Again, literally, it's, I really feel like God is saying if we deny the necessities for the body of Christ, that we are not fulfilling our, our call in our life. Amen? It says, which are needed, not what are wanted, but what is needed for the body of Christ. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Is dead. And James was the half-brother, the brother of Jesus Christ, and he's calling out the church and saying, let's not be hypocrites. Let's not be found in hypocrisy. Let us be serving the body as Christ served us. Amen? So this is the hour. Amen? I want, if you've got your Bibles, would you open up to Acts right now? Acts 29. Let me know when you get there. The book of Acts, chapter 29. There is no chapter 29, is there? <laughs> this 28 is the last chapter, right? God is writing it right now, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We are Acts 29. It's our chance to leave an impression, to get involved, to be part of God's kingdom and what it is doing today. Amen? God hasn't closed the book yet. It's still, it's still unfolding before us, and we're watching it today. And we can be, like, look, we can read and we can think, oh, wow, look at all these people and study and, and know every answer and every story and every turn and every twist of the body, but just sit in our lazy boys with our hands on our, under our, our, our tushes, right? Or we can become the church. We can, we can allow God to work through us. We can become Acts 29. We can be included in his story. It's for us to choose. 
That's the exciting part. We are living in one of the most exciting times of our lives. We know, as the bride of Christ, uh, that Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon. And it's our responsibility to prepare for him and to be at work, to use the talents he has given us. We can be people that have talents that go bury them in the dirt somewhere, right? Take no chance, not get involved, play it safe, whatever the case may be. But what did Jesus say to that, that, to that servant? He said, wicked servant. He says, man, I've given you all the resources you need. You had, you had the kingdom of heaven as an access point for you to, to tap into those reserves and for me to use you as that conduit. Because a talent actually was an incredible amount of wealth. We're talking ridiculous amount of wealth. I forget, I, I, I preached on it one time, but you're talking, when you're talking 10, 5, or one talent, you're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars in today's economy. And that number keeps rising with inflation, by the way. <laughs> but God says, I have given you so many resources for me to funnel those resources through you into my body. And it's for us to be involved, for us to be engaged in what God is doing today. It's not about just studying the word, it's becoming and allowing God's word to function and flow through us. Amen? So let's be part of this story. I believe as the church, it is our responsibility. I believe that we would be irresponsible at best, at best, is if we just sat here and ignored the need. Ignored the need. We would be just like those Ukrainians reaching out to their brothers and sisters in, in Russia and saying, man, we need help. We need help desperately. We need you to, to rise to the occasion. And I believe we can rise to the occasion today as we move forward. Acts 13, if you, go, if you just turn back a little bit to Acts 13, we see how God uses the church, and his people to meet the needs of his body. Here's Barnabas and Saul, and this is before their first missionary journey. And they take a trip down to Jerusalem from Antioch, the church that they're serving at, and they bring famine relief. They bring this offering that they collected, and they bring it down to Jerusalem and give it to the Jerusalem church because there's this fam famine that's taking place in Jerusalem and they're in need. So the church in Antioch decides that they want to become part of this and bring aid and assistance through that church and through Barnabas and Saul. Later, you read about through Acts and you read about in, in the first and second Corinthians and Roman um, in his missions trips, Paul's missions trips, where he gathers uh, offerings, and he's responsible to take them back to Jerusalem again because now Jerusalem not only maybe has gone through this, this famine, but now Jerusalem is being severely persecuted by the Jews. So many Jews are displaced. Many Jews might have lost their job or whatever the case may be, and the church needs assistance. And you see the other churches throughout all of Asia Minor and all around, collecting their resources together to, to funnel them into Christ's body at Jerusalem. At Jerusalem. I'm going to end in this. Hebrews 13, 1 through 3 says this. Let brotherly love continue. And that word brotherly love is literally Philadelphia. It's where we get the word Philadelphia today in Pennsylvania, which is the city of brotherly what? Love, right? It's the city of brotherly love. It comes from that Greek word. And that word means a, a love, a deep love and friendship. And the word continue actually is meno, which means abide. It literally takes the form of enduring through the face of difficulties. 
Just as Christ says to abide in me, he's literally saying for the church to abide in this brotherly love and not to depart from it ever. Until I come again, you continue to abide in this brotherly love, right? We're family. We're in this together. Amen? What's family do when you get into the difficulty? If most of you, yeah, some of you are like, don't ask, but... But many of you guys come from family, and you know what? Family's got your back, right? As weird as we can be towards each other, when, when it gets rough, when things get difficult, when, you know, when, when everything seems to be falling apart, you know you got one person to depend on, and that's, that's your family, right? That they're going to come through, and, and, and they're going to show themselves, regardless of the cost. And that's the amazing thing of being part of this body, We're a family. We're tied together. And Christ is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying through Hebrews that to allow this this Philadelphia, this brotherly love to continue to provide for each other, continue to bless each other, continue to pray for each other, continue to encourage each other, right? To stand alongside, right? That's what it's all about. Saying you're not going to go through this Devante, by yourself, I'm going to walk through it with you. Right? That's what we do. Amen? And it says, do not, and it continues, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers. And that, that word entertain is, is translated even to hospitality, but it really is, means a love for strangers, a deep affection for strangers. And that's what Christ is calling us to do. We might not know our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, and they might be strangers to us, but it literally says, don't forget them. That's what the Word of God says, don't forget them. And you know what really happens, which is really, there's a connection here. It says, for by doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. There's a connection there, right? He says, by you just being faithful in this commission, you don't even know what's taking place in the heavenlies. You don't even know how you might be blessing something and moving something in the heavenlies. It's powerful. We even see it in scriptures at time. And it's so powerful. And even Jesus gives this, this, this illustration through, through his parable of, of even if we give the least of these, a cup of cold water, we don't lose our reward because we're like giving it unto Him. He says, when you saw me naked and thirsty and hungry and in prison, you visited me and you provided for me. And and we'll stand before the Lord Almighty one day and we're going to say, when did we see you naked and distressed and persecuted and hungry and all of those things? And the Lord's going to say, when you did it to the least of these, you were doing it unto me. You were entertaining my spirit. Amen? Praise God. How cool is that? We should be excited. We should be excited about getting involved. And it says, remember the prisoners as if we were chained with them. Chained with them. Those mistreated since you yourself are also the body. Also the body. Amen? One translation says, remember those in prison and being mistreated as if you were in prison with them and going through their torture yourself. Man, if, if that was us in Ukraine right now, or if, if it was the United States, because guys, we might have that possibility to have to run this gauntlet as well. Where is the church going to be for us? You know, are they going to run and hide and tuck away and say, you know, that doesn't affect me, so I'm just going to turn a blind blind eye to it? Because if it's happening there at a large scale, it can happen in this church amongst each other. Right? It starts with the little things. It starts with the little things. Amen? So I think I'm going to end there. I'm going to end there. But I found this... this, um, Ministry. I listened to a podcast. It's called Koinonia Ministry. It's it's a man named Randy Strombeck, and his father started this ministry in Ukraine even before Ukraine was actually a sovereign nation. 
his father was literally in the square when they took down the Russian flag and they and they and in its place they put the Ukrainian flag. And they've been ministering in the Ukraine for years and years and decades. And what they have targeted is the young people of Ukraine, which somewhere he says between 18 to, to 40 or something of that nature is their, their target, where they take young men and they disciple them and they make them leaders and train them up to, to, to be sent out into Ukraine and all throughout Europe to spread the good news. Well, what has taken place now is now that their land is war-torn, war these people, all of these that they've been training up for decades now, are saying, this is our moment. This is our time. We want to stand with our people. We want to be here because this is what God has created us to do. So they're staying behind the lines. And they're going and they're feeding people. They're opening their houses up for all of these refugees are traveling to, um, to wherever, Poland or wherever they're going to. And they're, they're allowing them to, to shower and bathe and to wash their clothes and to feed them and even to provide for them in their own homes and prepare for them so they can continue their travel. If they're out of gas, they're using their own resources to fill their tanks or, or whatever or give them money so they can continue to make it to their destination. He says, and it's amazing because he says, in one house alone, and they have, I don't know how many, I'm not even going to say, but lots of homes all throughout Ukraine, he says. He says, one house alone, they're seeing somewhere between 75 to 100 decisions a day for Christ. A day for Christ. God is using this, people. He's staging the ground. He's, the time right now is so ripe to see the harvest take place. And it's our time to get involved and to sow into this. And he's praying and he's believing. He says, for every life that is lost, because I'm praying not for 30, 60, or 100 fold. He goes, I'm praying for a million fold. That, that not one life is wasted. He says, and we're seeing right now, he says, we're seeing the church that we read about in Acts taking place right now in Ukraine. People are becoming incredibly sensitive to God's move and his spirit. And people are moving powerfully. So what I want to say, and this is, this, is where, this is where it's going. This is where the rubber hits the road for us. Is some of you guys I know maybe aren't in a financial situation where you can afford to. But we're going to do love offerings for the Ukraine in the back. If you have something you want to give for these next two weeks. So next week and the following week, we're going to collect for the Ukraine. Give it to them. I will make sure it gets to this guy's hands.